my boss made the mistake of asking me about house plans this morning. Oh, no. So oh, that I didn't get any work done until an hour and a half after I got there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised it only took an hour and a half. Did she have to leave? <laughs> yeah, I think she had a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Midlight Crisis, a real podcast hosted by three grown-up biologists revisiting books from our teens, and it's totally cool. I am Sophie, one of your hosts, and I have a randomly generated fantasy name for today. I literally, I literally do not know how to say this one out loud, so (laughs) just come with me on this journey. (laughs) So my name today is, uh, <laughs> sorry, my name is Mbul Creature Strange. <laughs> what? So, take it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> my, my name is Mbul <laughs> Creature Strange. <laughs> Lovely. Mbul. <laughs> Mbul. <laughs> How do you spell that? M B E L E. I don't know how the generator made this. The implication here is that you put in because you put in two half of names. Yeah. The first and the second half. You put an M as the first half. I feel like I did do that. Mbull. Mbull. Oh yeah, uh, I did anyway. do that. Yep. You can just call me, I guess. Mm. Miss Creature Strange. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Just skip the first name. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Mbull. <laughs> Mbull. It sounds like I'm part of that. Uh... Sounds like Mbop. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I'm part of the 90s band. Yeah. Mbop. Hanson. Hanson. That's what it yeah. is. <laughs> My hit single, Mbull. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> What are your guys' names? Well, it's not Umbol, uh, but uh, my real name is Sam, but today you can call me Vatling Wolfmother. Whoa, Whoa. Vatling. Vatling? Vatling Wolfmother. I like Vatling. Wow. Yeah, me and too. It makes you sound like an afterthought. It's like, eh, yeah. Vatling over there. <laughs> or like Vatling. how like baby pterosaurs are called flaplings. <laughs> No, they're and not. Yeah. Flapping? They sure are. Stop. You can tell a scientist came up with that. <laughs> yep. Because it's goofy. <laughs> it's goofy as hell. Oh, I love it. Yeah, so you're a baby that. <laughs> you're a baby that. <laughs> I'm a baby that that is mother of wolves. Oh my god. <laughs> that, that makes you sound like you're from like a Roald Dahl book or something. Yeah. Or like Dr. Yeah. Seuss. Yeah. All of the that's, thems, and theirs. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take that. I've always wanted to see a baby conjunction. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I'm not a conjunction or a handsome uh-huh. song. Or <laughs> a handsome song. <laughs> My name is Hannah, but for the purposes of today's podcast, you can call me by my randomly generated fantasy name, which is Greggy Vampire Sword. <laughs> Greggy? <laughs> Greggy. Greggy! I'm just like a little fella Aww. with a nice vampire sword. <laughs> Isn't there like some horror thing where the character's named Greg? Or is that like some YouTube meme? Yeah, old Greg. Old Greg, Greg. yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. (laughs) Yeah, just a really topical meme. Old Greg. Old Greg. I have no idea what we're talking about. (laughs) I'm old Greg. You're old Greggy. (laughs) Okay. Wait, what was the last name again? Uh, Vampire Sword, obviously. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yes, of course. (laughs) Does the sword, like, drink blood, probably? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I did think of it as, like, a sword that a vampire has but that's not really what it says is it no then it would have to be vampire's sword yeah there'd have to be an apostrophe in there like Uh zarok zarok a vampire that is a sword whoa 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 
Well. You 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 were a vampire, but a wizard cursed you, and now you are and a vampire a real sword. huntress's <laughs> sword, and she's using you to kill other vampires, and you like live in this sword and knowing this, and then all of a sudden something happens that breaks your curse, and then bam, you're out, and then you fight, and, my and name then fall in love, and yeah. I can't believe you're describing the plot of Sword Heart by T. Kingfisher that you still haven't read yet. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Please tell me I'm not, actually, because I will take that out from the library, like, right now. Actually, I think the problem is is they don't have the audiobook in the no, library. No, they do yeah. only have the ebook. That's basically the plot, though. Whoa. Is it actually? <laughs> no. Uh, but a lot of it... <laughs> Whoa. Okay, okay, I'll I'll move it up, Sophie. It's, it'll come up. I just wish that the audiobook was on the library. Yeah. Alas. <laughs> Dang. Anyway, instead of talking about that book, which yeah. is a great book, but we can talk about Aragon instead, which is the book we're reading for which this podcast. Which is also a great book, right, Sophie? <laughs> yeah, for like sure. Like Sam, it's a great book. Yeah, Your we favorite? all agree. That, those are... I agree that those are words you said. Yep. Those are One words that you said. One out of three podcasters agree. Aragon is a great book. Yeah. One out of three. <laughs> <laughs> we we read chapter 47 and 48 this week. And now the other two people on this podcast are going to tell us what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so chapter yes. 47 is A Clash of Wills. So the chapter starts with our adventure party trying to outrun the Urgles for the hundredth time, it feels like. While <laughs> running, though, they come across a mysterious group of people who turn out to be a bunch of slavers, who then try to capture Aragon, Murtaugh, and Arya, but then Saphira comes in or swoops in and scares them all off, and Murtaugh takes the head off the leader, which very much upsets Aragon, creating a clash of wills, as mm. you would say. Mm. They get into another heated argument, uh, continue to ride on, then set up camp where Aragon sulkily takes the first watch and Saphira curls up right beside him. But he does not fall asleep. He he simply sits staring out into the dark. Everyone else falls asleep, but yeah. not Aragon. <laughs> not not Aragon. Aragon. It's different. <laughs> it's so different. It's different. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, in flight through the valley, uh -huh. Aragon is still shook from the previous day and decides to ride on Saphira so that he can avoid Murtag for a while. Then he sees the goddamn Urgles again and realizes <laughs> that they're being outpaced. So our fearsome foursome race on towards the valley that Aragon saw in Arya's mind that will lead them to the Varden. And with several mishaps along the way, which I'm sure we'll get into, they flee <laughs> towards its end. Murtag becomes increasingly agitated the further in they go, as he notices that there are no ways out, and he's being trapped between the Rock of the Giant Urgles and the Hard Place of the Varden. Aragon demands to finally know why Murtag is so adamantly against going to the Varden, and the truth is revealed. Murtag is the son of Morzan, first and last Ooh. of the Forsworn. Oh, oh damn! My God, you guys. Oh my god! The big reveal! Whoa! The big reveal! Wow! Does that mean Aragon is also related to them? <laughs> Why Who knows? <laughs> no, they're, they're in love. Like they're brothers. <laughs> no, no, yeah, they're definitely just in love. They're in love. Okay. They can't be related. They're happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how that that's works. Fine. That's how that. Works. Oh God! <laughs> yes. Tell Cassandra Clare that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, back to Aragon. Anyway. Back yes. to Aragon. I, f the start of the first chapter is Aragon getting chafing all over his face on top of a sunburn. <laughs> and I am, I like physically cringed. It's awful. Truly he has no awful. skin on his legs or his face <laughs> or now. His face. Oh! And what he does have is sunburnt to hell. Oh my God. <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> Seriously. He's just, just suffering. So uh, much. Rip. Rip Aragon. Yeah, rip, rip. amazing that he hasn't cast a heal on himself. <laughs> if yeah, I had healing magic, I would heal myself every fifteen minutes. Like, yeah, it's like, oh, my knee kind of hurts. Yeah. Oh well. 
Not anymore. I got like a paper cut. Time to heal yep. myself. <laughs> yep. Stubbed my toe. Good thing I can heal that. Good thing. That anyway. was just an important note to start the chapter on. <laughs> it's a good thing you mentioned that because I was going to start with Safira because uh-huh. hunger claws her belly, in her words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is a weird way to say that. Uh, <laughs> But she goes off and hunts some of the gazelles. And it's just, I I feel like this is something that I've been noticing more and more. That this book clearly wants to have, like, high fantasy dialogue. But Christopher Paolini doesn't seem quite able to commit to it. It's We've talked about it before. But I feel like I'm noticing it more now. It's such a weird mix of old-timey, archaic fantasy speech and just kind of regular people talking in the 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. I I think reading it more, I, like, have gotten used to it, so it doesn't stand out as much to me as it did before. But, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, there are still just some times where I, like, get knocked out of whatever I'm reading by being like, why did Murtag say it like that? (laughs) Yeah. Like, a second ago, he was talking in, like, no contractions. Yeah. Sort of a classic high fantasy cadence or whatever. Yeah, it's interesting to see that here, because I'm going to reveal myself a little bit, I guess. (laughs) But, like, I enjoy reading fan fiction. Usually not the Hornet kind, so relax. (laughs) But... (laughs) But one of the things that will, like, take me out of it so quickly and I'll, like, immediately stop whatever I'm reading is if the dialogue style doesn't match up with the source material. Right. Yeah. And I feel like that's what's happening here. But this is the source <laughs> the material. The source material is it not. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the source material doesn't match itself, which is just off-putting, I think. Yeah, it's like it's like the characters slip out of their own characterization sometimes just yeah. with the way they talk which is like like I honestly don't care if I was reading this and like they weren't speaking in like kind of your standard high fantasy yeah yeah speech but it's just when they like bounce back and forth you know mm-hmm. that's kind of weird it takes you away from the illusion right exactly you just like you don't feel like you're in a fantasy novel anymore but then like the constant back and forth is maddening and i do the same thing when i read fan fiction fan fiction hannah as soon as like if i'm reading and it's all great and then one thing is like all of a sudden just like yeah. <laughs> completely wildly like out of character i stop uh-huh. like i'm just yeah. like uh, okay no not bye yeah yeah it's very interesting to get that same effect in like a published work or I guess a traditionally published work. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, like, it's not a problem. It's just one of those things you notice when you're reading a book in this absolutely oh, maddening God. format. <laughs> in this, in the worst way possible. <laughs> Still at the beginning of this chapter, there's <laughs> just such a small, again, small detail. Uh, Murtag <laughs> mentions that Tornak and Snowfire are war horses. Yeah. But that mm-hmm. the slavers who come up to like enslave them, I guess. Enslave them. <laughs> is the word. Yeah. yeah. Is the word for it. Uh, yeah. The slavers are riding horses that are meant for running. Mm-hmm. So I, I looked up what a war horse was. Mm-hmm. And it's basically just like training. Like it's not really. Oh. It's not like breeding necessarily. Like there are horses that are obviously better at running. Like, you know, race horses and stuff, which are, uh-huh. I guess, like, thoroughbreds. I don't know anything about horses, but thoroughbreds are the ones that look wild. <laughs> yeah. Because they're, like, just leg. <laughs> they're just, yeah, they're just <laughs> all, all leg. <laughs> yeah, but apparently um, a war horse, like, because especially in, like, medieval books... <laughs> medieval medieval fantasy books (laughs) yes you read about like a destrier horse or whatever you know like a knight's horse is like a i don't know that i'm saying that right let me just just let me just check that destrier (laughs) i was right a destrier yeah and so it's usually like a stallion that's been specially trained okay and the difference 
because of the train, like the training, I guess, kind of makes them look different in that they have like very powerful hindquarters. Same. But <laughs> powerful. Yeah. <laughs> But what is stressed upon is how much training they have to go through because horses want to run away from, like, fighting. So to have a war horse, you have to, like, extensively train them not to run away. And then also sometimes you not necessarily train them, but I guess, like, positive reinforcement them, like, kicking or, like, getting up on their hind legs and then, like, landing on stuff. You know, like, actually fighting sometimes. Yeah. And so my question is, how the hell did they find a trained war horse in like Nowheresville near Carvajal? <laughs> like, um, they like Snowfire <laughs> is a trained war horse? Are you no, sure? He's so special. He's so special. He's so special. <laughs> You're forgetting that a crucial fact. Yeah. Like, I would believe that Murtag has a trained yeah. war horse, but like, mm-hmm. Snowfire is just a really special horse. I don't just think he's so special. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's trained for war, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of the Empire and, like, Galbatar's control, he may have, like, a mandate that requires all horses within the kingdom to be trained to be war horses should war break out so that every horse can be, like, called for the need. Mm-hmm. That's, like, a great way to train a militia in your yeah. town, though. Yeah. <laughs> True, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Why would Galbatorx want people to have war horses? Mm-hmm. That's also a good point. But I feel like either of those would kind of fit in with the established lore of this place, right? Yeah, yeah. like I I would believe that maybe this guy like happens to be a war horse trainer for like the local whatever. Yeah, stable. Yeah, like maybe people come to him to buy war horses, but it's like this is the first time it was mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe Murtag is just trying to make Aragon feel good by being like both of our horses are yeah. our horses, <laughs> not just mine. <laughs> maybe Doesn't my horse is great. Down. <laughs> yours is okay. <laughs> yes, yours is all right, I guess. Yeah, Aragon is a cinnamon <laughs> roll, and we must make him feel special. Yeah, of course. Of I course. mean, you read the last chapter. Mer- uh, Aragon makes everybody feel like they need to protect him, according yep. to Murtag. <laughs> it's true. Maybe that yeah. also includes his feelings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was just, it was just very funny to me. <laughs> yes, and then these slavers have thoroughbreds. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because, again, like, the difference between, like, a Destrier and a regular horse was just, like, I guess how much they work out. (laughs) So, (laughs) and I guess they don't work out the running muscles as much. (laughs) Mm. Isn't it, like, a thing where you can't be, like, super jacked and super fast? You kind of have, like, when you get to the, to either end of either strength training or, like, cardio distance training, you kind of have to pick one. Maybe the same that as That sounds horses. right. Yeah, I, mean, I learned that when I briefly right. uh, researched exercising, and then I was like, actually, I don't want to do either of these. <laughs> Isn't it that there are, like, they develop different muscle, is it? like physical muscle fibers? I think so. Yeah, because, well, now I'm not sure, but isn't running, like, a fast muscle and, like, weightlifting would be a slow muscle? Yeah. I, yeah. Again. I don't know a lot about human yeah. biology. <laughs> you can, depending on your sport, you can do targeted weight training that yeah. like helps with whatever your sport is. But if you're doing like the weight training that's like used in those like fitness competitions, like where you're basically just trying to get all muscle, no yeah. water, then your muscles wouldn't be very good for cardio. No. Yeah. So the same is probably true of horses. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, totally. Probably makes sense. <laughs> yeah, makes we sense are, know a lot. Who knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we they know have, a lot about physiology. <laughs> they have just <laughs> different muscles that are extenuated and targeted for their specific task due to repetitive training of that task. Sure. Yes. They're just yeah. really good at warring. 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 Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Anyway. <laughs> anyway, Murtag tells Aragon to tell Safira <laughs> to hurry yeah. back from her hunting because these patrols or raided groups or bandits who are actually slavers are surrounding them. Mm hmm. And Aragon says, don't show yourself unless it's necessary. We're not in the Empire, but I still don't want anyone to know about you. And then, like, two seconds later, he... What's the phrasing? He gets Sephira to land behind him, and he bellows, Behold, I am a rider! Flee if you wish to live! <laughs> yeah. It was so I mean, ridiculous. it's a good strategy. It is Actually, a good strategy. it's a bad strategy. Because it's also that. It's the worst strategy, because, like, literally... It's the uh, Aragon. <laughs> People can't see you and your dragon. Like right? you're literally most wanted in the empire. Like yeah, and somehow they don't notice that when the slavers are surrounding them, like before Saphira shows up, they don't notice that one just like walks up to Arya and is like, "Hey, he's an elf." Yeah. <laughs> like, like so now these like random people know that they have an elf and one of them is a dragon rider it's like listen you yeah. do kind of gotta kill all of them now <laughs> yep. uh -huh. aragon's order to safira is attack now but let them escape if they run it's like brahm like castigated you for days about doing this for urgles have you learned nothing yeah <laughs> you can't let your enemies escape or you will die yeah and then he got so mad at murtag for killing one of them so yep. It's like, no, you need to kill all of them. I'm sorry that you have empathy and it's uncomfortable yeah. for you, but like this is literally life and death for you and for Safira. Like <laughs> Yeah, you like you're trying them. to escape the Empire and go somewhere where like you don't want people to find you. Like you're literally going to the Varden. And they yeah. are not going to think it's cool if you just like revealed yourself to a bunch of people. Yeah. Right outside their door. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. We're gone. <laughs> yeah, and plus, the, when he was in um, Dras Leona, was that where they saw the slavers and the yeah. slaves? Yeah. Yeah. Like, he has a whole section where he's basically just like, man, and if I put a stop to Galbatorix, I could get rid of all these slavers. It's like, you, and now you're mad at Murtag for killing the yeah, slavers? Yeah, it's like you <laughs> You just had an opportunity to get rid of several. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yep. It's the whole honor yeah. thing, right? Like, it's like yeah, this thing that's that. engraved in people, right? Where it's like, oh, he's unarmed. You can't kill him. Da -da -da. I'm like, that's a shit piece of shit human being. Like, yeah. yeah. That's how you get yourself killed a la Game of Thrones. By holding <laughs> to your honor when shitty people are gonna be shitty and not hold to that honor yeah 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 and it's like arrogant you live in fantasy world like you don't have the liberty of letting people who wish you harm live like yeah. sorry bud but you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get used to it and i think yeah it's, i think it's probably coming from the perspective that this is like a middle grade book and like they're yeah, supposed guess... to teach that like murders <sighs> you bad there can be no gray area <laughs> but at the same point then why even include that discourse you know yeah i don't i don't know it was an interesting choice in my opinion yeah i mean it's very much building up like this is why aragon is the chosen one or whatever you know it's like because he's yeah. gonna keep his moral yeah. code even no matter what it's like well uh, I like yeah. Murtag a lot more. <laughs> yeah, like, me too. Like, yeah. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> no, this is a great scene, I think, for Murtag. Yeah. He is, like, so... I mean, obviously, like, he kills a person who at that point is, like, unarmed. But yeah. still, like, he is so practical about it. Yeah. Yeah. He's an adult. Yeah, when he's <laughs> like, I'm not doing this because it's fun. Like, I'm not... I didn't kill yeah. somebody because I have, like, bloodlust. I did it because it was the thing I had to do to survive. And yeah. Aragorn doesn't understand having to do that. And, like, Murtag... A child. We have learned, and we'll learn at the end of this chapter, like, had... Or has had a pretty fraught existence and learned mm -hmm. young that, like, he has to prioritize himself even at the expense of other people, maybe even their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so 
practical. I feel like I sound like deranged, but <laughs> no. But it's like it's also weird because like the vibe I get from the two chapters because Aragon like struggles with this for the whole yeah. two chapters and thinks about it a lot and brings it up again and blah 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 and. Mm-hmm. It's that it feels like what it's leading towards is Aragon coming to like a decision where he's like, I will never be like that. You know, like, yeah. like it feels like it's yeah. leading towards Aragon crystallizing his moral code to show again that he's the hero. Yeah. And like, oh, this is why he's the hero because he's so good. And it's like, I don't think that like Murtag being forced to do like various <laughs> things to make sure that he survives means he's not a good person (laughs) yeah (laughs) like it's yeah (laughs) it just sets things up so poorly right and but you see it all the time in like especially kids media or middle grade media it's like Mm -hmm. yeah the the hero can't do no wrong right so you have to have this other character who does all the reasonable right things because it's like a child can't comprehend that those were bad things but done under the right intents or something like that so it's like no the hero is incomparable like they can yeah. do no wrong i mean i would argue kids can comprehend that and it's yeah. adults making the decision <laughs> yeah that they is can't. <laughs> fair oh, yeah i've been yeah. annoyed about this trope since like pre-pubescence yeah, yeah. Like... Okay. Uh, okay i take that back then yeah no i think you're right that this is like the concept adult. Oh yeah. Whoever is making the decisions on whether to include these things or not. I think you're right yeah. that that's yeah. what is yeah. believed. I, I agree. <laughs> Murtag right now is like the more interesting character. Like I would oh, much sure. rather read about the character who is just trying to survive and do the right thing <laughs> and has to do some <laughs> shitty things sometimes. Sam wants Are to you... read about the morally gray character. Are yeah, you right, joking? Damn it, why do Wild. I have to be like this? <laughs> with, the dark, with the dark backstory? Oh, uh, I knew Damn. you'd like him. <laughs> I'm gonna, Weird. I just dug myself into such a hole, didn't I? <laughs> Set yourself no, but up you're right. Like, <laughs> Aragon is such... Like, he's definitely coming at this from a place of privilege, almost. Where, yeah, like, yeah, he's yeah. had yes. the luxury yes. in his yep. life to have grown up in, like, a secure, safe environment yes. with someone who clearly like cared about him right yeah Mm -hmm. so he has the luxury of making the moral decision rather than the practical one yeah that's 100 percent it right there yeah 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 Yeah. it doesn't really bother me that he has that perspective what bothers me is that he doubles down on it and like yes really comes to the comes to the conclusion even that he doesn't know if he wants to stay friends with murtag because of the decision murtag has yeah And I think that's the big thing, right? Is like, he's bringing this moral high ground and trying to make Murtag be the bad guy when that's not the case at all because he's just like so pure and good. And like you said, from this place of privilege where he's never had to do anything questionable to survive. So it's like, why are you looking down on this other person when you know he's a good person? He's your friend. He's saved your life. He's done all this shit. And now you're just going to be like, oh, okay, no, you just like murdered someone apparently. And like, I can't, I can't deal with that. Even though that person would have sold your location out, would have brought more people to try to find you, was going to sell you for money and has sold probably hundreds and thousands of people for money. Like, yeah, that's a shitty person. Yeah. Yeah. If obviously it would be different if Murtag was like doing it if he didn't have to you know like that's one thing but like yeah having the emphasis especially in these chapters being like i would have died (laughs) yeah if i didn't do these things and it's like yeah "Yeah." privilege aragon (laughs) so privileged i would love like they like part ways because of this disagreement (sighs) And then in, like, a year or two, Aragon, like, they come back together and Aragon's like, you were right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Aragon's had to become more practical because Galvatorix is trying to murder him at every turn. The yeah. Varden are just using him as a figurehead or whatever, you know? Yeah. And then yep. Aragon's like, hey, Murtag, 
uh i need yeah, to sorry, apologize <laughs> yes you're right <laughs> Yeah, anyway. one of the most interesting things about this is that Safira is on Murtag's side. Like, she yeah. doesn't agree yeah. with Aragon, and she keeps trying to convince him. Murtag is just doing the necessary thing. Like, you don't have the luxury to think like this, and he's still... Yeah. Even, like, against the two of them, who at this point are the two closest people in his life, right? Yeah. He yeah. is so convinced of his own moral position that he won't consider theirs. Yep. Yeah. That's such a teen boy thing to do. Right, so. yeah. And, <laughs> well, even just like very like sheltered teen. Because I yeah. I mean, I've never been, I will admit, a particularly like non-judgmental person. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like definitely more so like when I was a kid, I had a much harder time figuring empathy out, right? Where it's like, well, yeah, I don't understand why you feel like this. What's your problem? Yeah. yeah. So, like, from that teen perspective, I totally get it. Yeah. But as an adult reading it, I'm like, get over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we've talked about this before, but, like, even against Safira, Aragon has way more, like, is way more privileged than her, right? Because, like, again, yeah. her entire yeah. existence depends on the Empire not catching them right yeah. like <laughs> yeah like her entire existence is in danger all the time constantly because yeah. of how the world is <laughs> yeah so of course she agrees with Murtag yeah like Murtag she's she's endangered just for existing the way Murtag phrases it is very interesting he says yeah. like my life has been threatened from the day I was born all of my waking hours have been spent avoiding danger in one form or another. If there was ever a time I felt secure, it must have been in my mother's womb, though I wasn't even safe there. And you don't understand. If you lived with this fear, you would have learned the same lesson I did. Do not take chances. Which yeah. is very, I think, a very like powerful way of, like, a very powerful and kind of raw way of explaining where Murtag is coming from. And the same yeah. thing does apply to Safira. Her entire existence, she has been hunted purely for being what she is. Yeah. And Aragon still doesn't understand that. Still somehow. doesn't get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty wild. Yeah. Anyway, also, Safira almost eats <laughs> the slavers I decapitated. <laughs> So hard. I <laughs> wanted her to. Even the fact oh that he God. just like wrote that sentence, I was like, okay, Please. that gets you a point, Palini. Like, okay. That oh was God. it was funny. That was good. It's such a good little character moment. It's yeah. Sophia sniffed <laughs> Turkenbrand, the slaver's head curiously. She opened her mouth slightly as if to snap it up, then appeared to decide better of it. Like that's just <laughs> I, I can picture it so it. vividly, too. Yeah. Just, oh, it's such a good scene. Oh, oh that would be so funny. It, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, then Aragon wouldn't be speaking to her either. Yeah. That's true. But it, it would have been so good. It would have been so funny. Oh, that was yeah. great. It was a good Yeah, moment. it was so good. So good. It's just solidifying <sighs> that, like, I mean, listen, I'm the Safira apologist. Yeah. We all know this. Yes. But this is just like such a good yeah. Sephira character moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just just without even saying it, you could see the thought process. <laughs> yeah. Like, mm, Aragon will be mad at me. Yeah, like it's two sentences, but it gives you so much about Sephira and like about this scene as a whole. Like it's so good yeah. yeah an example of christopher pralini's good writing yeah i would say man thinking too hard about like a sentient creature eating another sentient creature is just gonna yeah. um mess me up so yeah, let's, <laughs> all right let's uh, move on let's <laughs> yeah. move on i'm like oh my god do the dragons just like eat <laughs> Uh, anyway uh <laughs> let's move on wasn't that where the war that's what we were started? hypothetically yeah, okay thinking but now i'm thinking about it more <laughs> okay let's move on <laughs> let's move on we should probably go to the next chapter but before we do yeah. that yeah i just want to say that uh safira tells aragon that she loves yeah. him 
<laughs> he says it back. Yeah. And I thought that was very cute. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's all I had to say. And then she curls up into a ball next to him. Oh, it's yeah. so nice. have a sleep. Safira is so great. <laughs> I love yeah. her. <laughs> Unequi- unequivocally, just 100% perfect all yep. the time. Yep, she is yep. my unproblematic fave. She has never done anything wrong, ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then uh, the next chapter starts mm-hmm. with more of Aragon wrestling with his inner demons. Oh, yes. those demons. <laughs> his those inner demons. demons that are in the shape of Murtag. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Murtag. Yeah. It's uh, interesting how much disagreeing with Murtag's choices makes Aragon distressed. It's almost yeah. like he really, really cares about wow. who Murtag is as a person. Dang. Perhaps because they're in love. <laughs> Perhaps they are because in they're love. in love. <laughs> I called no. it how many chapters ago. They're just close friends. Yeah. They're just romantic. They're Bros. just friends. Yeah. They were roommates. Oh my god, they were roommates. <laughs> oh my god, they were roommates. <laughs> They were camp mates. <laughs> exactly. They were forest floor mates. Yep. Two bros with a dragon. Six feet apart. <laughs> 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 oh, funny. Anyway, during this conversation with Safira, they realized the god damn Urgles are still there. <laughs> Always with the god damn Urgles in this book. I did not remember there being so many Urgles. They're it's so not just fast. Just Oracle Urgles. Yeah, did they're the Urukai. Yeah, <laughs> I told you they're the Urukai or the Cull. Uh-huh. The Cull. Yeah, the Cull. Which we don't know yet if they're like a subspecies of Urgles or if it's just like all the biggest dudes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing it's all the like biggest well. dudes, but yeah. The only thing we really get is that they are extremely fierce and all over eight feet tall yeah Yeah. and they can like run faster than a horse (laughs) wow constantly i am again so mad that the aragon movie was so bad because i would love to see the urgles like i would love a visual representation yeah i am just imagining orcs i can't help it yeah i know me neither it's really hard to see anything else yeah this is interesting though because like the idea that the cull can like do all these things that normal urgles can't but would still have to be within a normal urgles capabilities if they just right like the like yeah being extra tall is like sure okay so maybe once you get tall you join the cull yeah Mm -hmm. but like the fact that they can outpace horses like implies that like humans they evolved to hunt while long distance running Uh because like because humans like even though we can't outrun like a we i certainly can't (laughs) (laughs) i can (laughs) hannah can Uh, i cannot so fast all the time Uh um no even though humans like can't outrun pretty much any animal in like a sprint humans evolved to do like long distance running where they essentially just like exhaust a prey animal because humans can just keep going way longer than other animals so like eventually a deer or whatever is just going to give up and be like i cannot walk anymore you have chased me for five days straight (laughs) yeah so that implies that like the urgles kind of evolved to do the same thing yeah maybe because humans weren't from allegasia Urgles mm. filled that niche. Yeah, that makes before sense. Before oh, yeah. humans showed up, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. I like that theory. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, not that like a niche necessarily needs to be filled, but. No, but if there a is good... a niche, it often is yeah. filled. It could be filled by an Urgle. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if there is a niche, it could if be filled by niche. an Urgle. <laughs> we need. Stickers of that. I'm gonna get a, I, uh, you I'm gonna make a that? t-shirt. Yeah, I'm gonna make a t-shirt that just has me like holding a cup of tea, being like, if there is a niche, <laughs> it could be filled by Urgles. 
<laughs> perfect. With a little dragon motif on the teacup. Yeah, So yeah, you know yeah. it's from Aragon. Exactly. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I think that does track, and maybe I'm misremembering, but I feel like we learned earlier that Urgles tend to be nomadic. Which yeah. it would yeah, make sense so. that you could walk for days if that's just kind of what you do. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's consistent. Although it's not consistent then that Murtag says Cull never leave their caves except for war, which is just nonsensical to me. Yeah. yeah unless their caves are like miles. Yeah, I guess they and could miles be like lava long. tubes. Yeah. Lava <laughs> tubes. <laughs> oh you know. sorry I, I, yeah no i thought at first you meant that they were in the tubes with the lava <laughs> like, yeah. oh my god <laughs> yeah it's how they harden themselves yeah. yeah i mean if we're going on the urukai similarities here maybe they're you just birthed from a ball of lava yeah they they just ball have exercise bikes in there <laughs> and they just, they just yeah, have no. these in class for days and days they have their like gigantic hamster wheels <laughs> like you yeah. can get for a cat but for someone yeah. who's eight feet tall oh now i'm just uh, imagining these calls in a cave with a bunch of gym equipment just like yeah. throwing out wearing like sweatbands and tiny yeah. shorts they just have yeah. like a track like a running track that they yeah. run in circles yeah. around oh god uh-huh. it's so depressing <laughs> Uh, or the opposite is them all just standing in like straight lines, just like waiting to be called, just like forever, yeah. just, just like like, in, like dormant. Like, yep. <laughs> maybe yeah. they're in a magical coma, and then they just like stand there in this magical coma that Galbatorix puts them in, and then when they're awoken, he just like takes the spell off them or something. Yeah, they're yeah. all Winter Soldiers. Yes, yeah. yes, that tracks. analogy. That's the yep. easiest possible yeah. situation <laughs> yeah like you said before sophie right parsimonious yeah. parsimonious parsimonious definitely it's definitely <laughs> not that they probably train and people don't see it and born out of lava Outside. yeah yeah they're born out of lava and then they become one with the cave walls until they're needed at which point they spontaneously erupt from the stone and become yeah. gigantic killing machines who can run for days without sleep yeah, I mean that, that is an Urukai. Yeah, all of it makes sense. Yeah. All of it makes sense. There's no <laughs> issues here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Anyway, I am torn between being annoyed that the Urgles show up in every other chapter and just like really wanting to know more about them. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Now that I know they can just run for days on end, I kind of want to know more about them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, maybe Aragon should go talk to them. Work. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think that will end well. Well, yeah, well probably not. Nah. Maybe Urgles are like cetaceans, which only sleep with half of their brain at a time, and they like well, some of them at least like harbor porpoises continue swimming while they're asleep. They have these like very stereotyped dive cycles. They will go up and down while they're asleep. So maybe these cull are like that. They just keep walking while they're asleep. I'm imagining that because, like, the cetacean thing works because there aren't, like, trees yeah. in the ocean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That the, the cull are, like, Can like those, imagine? like, trains of five-year-olds who all hold on to, like, a, yeah. a rope. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. They just get led by whoever's awake. <laughs> uh-huh. They all take turns at the front. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually a, a problem for purposes now that People have done things like put fishing nets in the water. Or like mm. wind farms. Yeah, well, I think nets are like the bigger issue. Yeah. Because you can swim into a net. Right. It's not like they go fast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to hurt themselves by running into like an island or something, but they are going to hurt themselves <laughs> by getting caught in a net and drowning. I think running into a like a wind turbine would hurt. <laughs> yeah, but, but probably not as much as drowning. If yeah, they're swimming not. with like half their brain, they're probably like going yeah. They don't at go very speed, fast, right? Like, so it would yeah. just be like when you like accidentally like <laughs> like when you walk into say, a door walk into a wall. <laughs> I was I was say, Have you ever walked into a door? Because it hurts no matter what speed you're going. Well, it does hurt, but it's not going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, it's right, just like okay. oh, ow, my yeah, face it's more and just my like body. a like oh, like a shock. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, unless you take, like, a doorknob to the pelvis. That's never fun. Oh, yeah. 
But I don't see a whale doing that. (laughs) They don't usually encounter doors and they don't lead with their pelvis. Yeah. Both things they don't do. Both two the two things that porpoises don't do. One, walk into doors. Two, walk pelvis forward. Yeah. (laughs) Three walk. Three the walk. calls would the calls could just calls get would. like a stick like in them. Yeah. yeah, I wonder. Wow. This is probably gross, but if they do sleepwalk, yeah, they must keep their, their genitals somewhere else compared to people. They explicitly say they camp like multiple times <laughs> in these chapters. We're not going to okay. talk about them sleeping while they're walking because they definitely don't. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. I'm done talking about cetaceans. And I'm pretty sure they're humanoid, so I feel like reproductive systems are fairly similar. Yeah. I don't want to talk about (laughs) Earth. Why not? I really don't. Okay. It's biology. It's biology. We talked about so many things in Twilight. (laughs) I was hoping for a break. Sophie, you were the one who brought up last time when we talked about sharks. Okay, but... I moved on very quickly. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Let's and it move on wasn't then. about Urgle dicks anyway. <laughs> That's true. It was about Saphir's dick legs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fully different. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway. I literally, yeah, I don't understand. Honestly, I really don't understand why Murtag has not left. Yeah. I don't either. You know, like. Oh, no, I do know. Love. Oh, yeah. Right. It's because they're in love. They're mm-hmm. in love. I forgot. Love. That's a great point. All of my arguments are moot now. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, like, talks about it at the beginning of the second chapter. Like, I'm going to leave you fly ahead with Sephira. And Aragon says, like, no, you're going to die if you do that. And then Murtag inexplicably changes his mind for, like, a yeah. few minutes. And he's like, okay, I'll come with you towards the Varden. And then I'll leave. And then a few minutes later, he changes his mind again and starts getting really squirrely that he won't be able to leave. Wait. So literally, like, that... It is that he's in love. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> that is it. It's love. That it. Now that you say it, it's like, oh, he's like, oh, Aragon wants me to stay? Okay. <laughs> oh. Dang. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, we're joking a lot. Like, clearly, they're ju- they, they genuinely they, seem yeah. to really care about each other, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. they're clearly yeah, very yeah, yeah. good friends, uh, despite yeah. all of our joking about how much of this book is like a romance novel, including some things that Sophie said I wasn't allowed to talk about in their You're recording not today. To talk about them. Yeah. <laughs> I vetoed it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Murtag changes his mind and stays with Aragon basically just long enough to get trapped. Yeah. I mean, it is pretty shitty of Aragon also, because, like, he doesn't take Murtag's wishes seriously yeah he just steals like he's them. not yeah he's sort of like oh maybe i'll keep an eye out for a valley that cuts away from this one so that he can leave when we get further in but he like doesn't really try very hard you know like he forgets yeah to look yeah when he's up on safira and like every time Marta brings this up aragon's like oh later yeah like, we'll deal with that later we'll deal with it later and it's like eventually you're not gonna have later it's, it's like Aragon doesn't believe that because he likes Murtag, mm-hmm. right? He doesn't believe that anything that Murtag has done or is could be bad enough that the Varden would hate him. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, because of that, he just doesn't listen when Murtag brings up valid concerns. <laughs> yeah. Well, even beyond that, it's just like he is so fixated on what he thinks is the right thing to do. That he's yep. not considering Murtag's wishes at all. Yeah. Like, even if Murtag doesn't have a good reason to not want to go to the Varden, he still clearly feels very strongly about it. And it's still, like, even if his reason is just like, I don't feel like it, it's still yeah. kind of shitty to keep, like, hurting him in, dire- in a direction until he's nev- uh, not going to have a choice anymore. Yeah. Yep. And it is, like, kind of apparent that Aragon kind of cares more about Arya's situation than Murtag's oh, sure. situation. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, so lovesick. Yeah. yeah. It's glaringly obvious. 
Oh, like yeah. you could you could argue that with his whole like moral code situation, he's like weighing the variables like, OK, well, if we don't go to the Varden, Arya definitely will die. If we yeah. do go to the Varden, Murtag isn't going to immediately die, you know, like yeah. surely not. And it's like, yeah, mm, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I also honestly don't think Aragon deserves that much credit. No, I think yeah. like for all he castigated Murtag about his lack of empathy in the previous chapter. Yeah. I think mm. Aragon just like he wants to go to the Varden. He wants to take Arya there and he wants Murtag to come with him. Yeah. I think yeah, is what it is. It's yeah. the Aragon show. It's whatever yeah. Aragon wants. <laughs> yeah, like he's not thinking about what Murtag wants because Aragon wants to stay with Murtag. So he's yeah. just going to bring Murtag with him. Yep. Which is like, I yeah. get it, but also that sucks. <laughs> Don't do that. What this could be stemming from is him having had so many people he cares about die. Yeah, right? And so he's uh, like, I need to keep yeah. these people I care about with me at all times. Yeah. So that I can protect them, you know? Yeah. But again, as we've said before, your shitty mental health doesn't mean you can be a shitty person. Yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> It's nope. a reason, but... <laughs> Explanation, not excuse. <laughs> yep. Poor I really Derek. want to talk about uh, the potential wolves. <laughs> that are in Yeah. This oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Okay, it's skipping a couple things. This was a long chapter. It was. There's so a lot long. that happens. I just... I really need it noted that Safira passes a flock of birds oh, that yeah. were black and green with red markings, and I have no idea what these f***ing birds are. <laughs> okay, I have a... <laughs> I had one thought that is kind of borderline. Okay. We know that Safira can see into UV oh. from previous chapters. And all I could think was like red winged blackbirds. Yeah. Because they probably have some, like, I'm sure to birds, they don't just look plain black. They probably have something right. going on. They have like a sheen to their feathers and then they have red markings. So even if it's not those, like maybe something similar. Yeah. But that's definitely... that's all I got. We, there was something that made us think that Safira could see. Yeah, well, her vision is tinted towards blue. Blue, right. And Aragon, okay. like, sees colors that he can't describe when he's looking right, through okay. her eyes. Right, yeah. right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I still, that's also, I was like, red markings on their wings, red winged blackbird. But also, those are North American. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. A bird that's, like, black and green Mm -hmm. Like, you kind of only see that in tropical birds. Yeah, I could be like wrong. Parrots, well. I thought. Yeah. Well, there's several different parrots that are primarily, like, black and green in yeah. some way, right? Yeah. But still. I don't, I don't know. I mean, the other, <laughs> the other possibility is that it's just, like, a fantasy bird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I guess, like, we, we did sort of decide that the Haderach Desert was, like, equivalent to the middle east or northeast africa yeah so in theory they're still going south so they could be in mountains that are in like northern africa yeah, yeah. quote unquote area yeah you know that makes sense so it could be parrots anyway yeah or even like south america has lots of mountains and lots of parrots <laughs> yeah but we're not in the americas <laughs> no I still think we're in the Americas. We're not. <laughs> it's I don't are there evergreens there? Yes. Well actually I can't say that. I don't know. I don't know either. I'm just gonna Google it real quick. Yeah, I, I okay, don't I'm think... not talking about South America, I'm talking about North Africa. <laughs> I'm talking oh, about I'm South so America. confused. <laughs> what are we talking about? North Africa? Okay. I have no idea. There are conifers in South America. If you want to look in Africa to prove your theory, you can Google yeah. it yourself. <laughs> in ancient historical times, much of North Africa was evergreen forest. Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> cool. Man, I don't know anything about the world. <laughs> Me neither. neither. Mediterranean conifer forests. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So Perfect. they still could be anywhere. They still could be anywhere. Except not North America. Um... <laughs> Go heck yourself. <laughs> go heck yourself. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. And then they go into this magical forest. I don't think it's magical. Which, oh, yes, it is. Well, <laughs> yeah. there there was something hostile in the air as if the trees resented their intrusion. Yeah, what the hell? What the hell? 
Like I thought <laughs> the, the spine was supposed happy. to be the magic forest. That's so weird. It's Are so there weird. ants there? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of tree like a sentient species. Yeah. Like I sort of thought there was only supposed to be one magical forest. Yeah. In your magical fantasy land. And now I'm if you're telling me Do Weldon Varden is not also a magic forest, you're lying to me. <laughs> every forest it's definitely is a magic going to forest. be. <laughs> yeah. It must be that every forest has magic. Because yeah, this is so. the third one. Yeah. And it's also I mean, assuming that Do Weldon Varden is magic, because there's it's again, gotta be. There's it has no a chance name. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope it comes up in the next chapter. Like, I hope, I don't know, they confront the Urgles and, like, the forest does something. You know? Yeah, That'd be me cool. Too. It would be cool. That'd be cool. Anyway. I, I kind of thought, because <laughs> a little bit later in this chapter, Aragon is going to try to, like, hamper the Urgle's progress with magic. Oh, yeah. And when that idea came up, I kind of thought he was going to either try to talk to the forest that had this like weird sentient yeah. feeling and get it to help him or that he was going to do something and the forest would attack him for trying to yeah. interfere with magic. I like, yeah, I thought one fun. of those two things was going to happen, but neither of them did. And yeah. Aragon is just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> just makes himself nearly die by doing magic a million miles away. <laughs> like he didn't, he hasn't learned from this the last like two times he almost killed himself using magic. Yeah. Sephira yells at him. <laughs> she does. Uh, classic Aragon. Yeah, like, I want to, like, give Aragon props for learning as he goes and, like, starting to kind of mature and make better decisions, but he keeps doing this kind of thing. Like, sort of the exact same thing over and over again. Yeah, Saphir says, among other things, you shouldn't have forgotten in the first place, and weren't you paying attention to anything Brom told you? Yeah, which is harsh but fair. It's harsh but true. <laughs> like she's right and she should say it, but also like yeah. ouch. <laughs> but also ouch. <laughs> and they do like an Icarus. Yeah, they definitely do. <laughs> they fly too high up. Oh, Aragon yeah. passes out and Safira almost passes out. Yep. <laughs> I like how your brain went Icarus and mine went Top Gun because of the new Top Gun movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just it's because Safira literally says, I'll never dare to fly so close to the sun again, which is uh, yes. that, very that's, Icarus. Yeah, Extremely no, that's really Icarus. That's fair. My brain just had Top Gun in brain currently because I saw it recently. And they one of the things is they go up really high, really fast. And so they have to not pass out. Isn't that more from G-Force than lack of oxygen, though? Yes. But that's still where my brain but went. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was still just going in altitude. Yeah. We should mention that when we're recording this, uh, Top Gun has just come out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> Sam's not just still obsessed with Top Gun. <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> I saw it like two weeks ago. And it was By what you new. mean. Ten weeks ago. Months ago. <laughs> Which I yeah. mean two months, three months ago. Yeah. Oh, boy. Do you guys want to know how high up they were? Yes. Yeah. Because there is a point where the altitude is too high to sustain human life because the oxygen is insufficient, mm -hmm. at least on Earth. I was going to say, <laughs> right, you're making yeah. some ass assumptions here, so Yeah. So uh, assuming Allegasia has the same sort of atmosphere <laughs> as Earth. <laughs> I don't know if I can suspend that disbelief, but go yeah. on. But, but yeah, go continue. On. <laughs> yeah, they were at 26,000 feet. Whoa. Wow. That yeah. seems like a lot. I have no real yeah. context for that. Yeah, because I also looked up uh, at what height the snow line is yeah. in the Himalayas. Because, again, kind of assuming it was the Himalayas-ish mm -hmm. <laughs> True. Yeah. type thing. And yeah. Because so, Aragon mentions that like ice starts forming on him. Yeah. Uh, and stuff like that. So that's usually 19,000 feet at the Himalayas, but it varies. Oh. It can vary with like where you are yeah. right. relative to the equator. Right. Yeah. That makes and sense. stuff. So who even knows? But then I also was like, do birds fly higher than that? Because I was wondering if that's why Sephira doesn't necessarily pass out as quickly. But like birds kind of average. Well, the higher ones. 
kind of <laughs> can fly to altitudes of like 10,000 to 13,000 feet. So I'm assuming it's just a case of that maybe like a bird, Saphira's lung morphology isn't the way a human's is, which is just like the one lung yeah. that you like breathe in and out one time. Like one breath just goes in and then out. Like birds breathe in and then the air gets breathed in into a second set of lungs, like a <laughs> more air sacs. Like they yeah. essentially breathe in twice for one exhale. <laughs> That's so weird. So that would maybe explain why she didn't pass out immediately. You know, like there's oxygen yeah. stored elsewhere in her body. Yeah. Which is my theory. I think that's I a good theory. That. And it makes sense that she has like a higher threshold for altitude simply based on the fact that she is a giant flying creature, right? In theory. In theory. In theory. In theory. I wonder. So my understanding is that. The highest flying bird is the Demoiselle Crane, I think. Sure. And they can fly up to 26,000 feet. Okay, cool. Which is pretty high. So maybe Safira can go yeah, there. Yeah, that sounds right. I don't know. They're the ones that fly <laughs> over the Himalayan mountains, which is just like an absolutely wild thing to do. Bonkers, yeah. Why yeah, because I mean, even? it's probably the same issue where like, they just run out of air, you know, like, yeah, or run out of oxygen, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there's still air, but it's less dense. Breathable. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Interesting. I do appreciate, like, as much as we uh, like to dunk on things like Saphira's serrated claws, there are some, like, interesting bits <laughs> of things like this where, obviously, Aragon in this world wouldn't know that, like, the air gets thinner higher up. Yeah. yeah. And then has to discover that and pay for it. And then uh, Saphira definitely is not foreshadowing anything when she says, we should remember this experience. The knowledge may be useful <laughs> if we ever have to fight another rider. Yeah, I don't know. That won't happen. No foreshadowing Or maybe a Razak. <laughs> or maybe a Razak. <laughs> definitely not. And then Aragon says, I hope that never happens, which... Also guarantees Always. that it definitely yeah, will. It happen. <laughs> will happen. Yeah. Long chapter, but I like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I do just want to super quick say the other math I did. Okay. Yeah. Which was because they go back to talk to Murtag multiple times. And one time Murtag is like, be careful here on the ground. I just saw wolf tracks that were as wide across as two of my hands. <laughs> so big. So I did some math. Uh huh. Like a saber Just tooth? to see what size this wolf is. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So a wolf at the shoulder is oh yeah, at the shoulder is like eighty five centimeters, which I don't know thirty three inches. <laughs> <laughs> Wolves are big. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah, but their paws are only about four inches wide. So you essentially have to double that to get to the wolf that Murtag saw tracks of. <laughs> so that wolf, by these measurements, would be 161 centimeters or 5.3 feet tall, which is oh at the shoulder, Ooh. which is as tall as me. <laughs> almost. It's a dire wolf. Jeez, so that's, big. that's about twice the size of an actual historical dire wolf. Wow. It's yeah. a fantasy dire wolf. Yeah. It's but so if you big. were wondering, it is about the exact same size as Enostrancevia, which is a Gorgonopsid. Oh, good to know. Yes, because yeah. that, that, that made sense to me. <laughs> That's a really good frame of reference, Sophie. Thanks. Yeah. Those were some, those were some great words you said. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can agree with that it's about the size of this one specific species of Gorgonopsid. Yeah. Is that a dinosaur? Uh, no, it's a proto-mammal. Oh. Yeah. Um, but it's about also the same size as a rhino. <laughs> Jesus. In what height. The not in frig. weight. Still big. Yeah. But could the possibility here be, because they're in the mountains, and the mountains are mostly snow, like they're a little bit below the snow line at this point, because they're still forests, but could uh -huh. it be that this wolf just has really big paws? To Aww, be able to move up paws. around in the snow. Oh, maybe. So maybe the wolf isn't that big, but it is big 
with snowshoe feet. My argument is that if it was <laughs> snowshoe feet, he wouldn't know it was a wolf, you know? That's fair. Because you have to see, like, the paw pads to be like, that's a wolf. Yeah, that's reasonable. But who knows? Maybe. Who knows? I wonder knows? if we will Not see me. these wolves. I hope so. Yeah. Maybe the wolves will just absolutely wreck the cull. <laughs> Should we talk a little bit about the shenanigans that Aragon and Sephira get into? Like, so fast. <laughs> So yeah, fast. Like, We've been real talking quick. for so long. Like, yeah, just, let's just let's just briefly mention them. Aragon is like, I'm gonna slow these Urgles down, and he tries to make a bunch of fog, and it almost kills him, mm-hmm. and it does nothing to the Urgles. And then Saphir is like, That was dumb. Why don't we just drop rocks on them? So yeah. they drop rocks on these Urgles for what seems like hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> it's so good. I also. I love it really love that like Saphir picks up the like one giant boulder at a time and then Aragon also gets like a couple of little rocks and like yeah <laughs> it's like yeah good job Aragon you're helping <laughs> well what is it is that like an urban myth that like oh, if you drop yeah. like a coin once it hits terminal velocity it can just like go through a human body or whatever <laughs> I believe that's an urban myth but still yeah. it would hurt I'm sure <laughs> Yeah, it, it, that was disproven, I'm pretty sure, but yes. Yeah. Probably Mythbusters. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure if that's what people thought, that yeah, if you like dropped a penny off the CN Tower in yeah, Toronto, I heard that. they could do that, but I don't, I think it just hurts. <laughs> okay, I did Google Mythbusters. A penny just can't gather enough velocity from the top of the <laughs> Empire State Building to yeah, do any real harm. Exactly. Which is what I thought the urban myth was about. <laughs> ah. Anyway, uh, so they drop some rocks. What else happens? Night happens, and then it gets cold, and night yeah. animals begin to creep from their dens. <laughs> <laughs> could be could be anything. Could be anything. I yeah. I'm imagining Sophie. a bunch of raccoons. Is Sophie a night <laughs> animal? Am I a night creature? <laughs> no, <laughs> I just... my cave? No, but I just imagined you <laughs> being like, ooh, fine. the night creatures, and then, like, going and looking at all of them. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably some whippoorwills. See? I was imagining raccoons. <laughs> Probably those two. Well, we're not in North America, so. Well, we are. So. <laughs> hedgehog. Actually, oh, it's. Maybe it is a hedgehog. It's North Hedgehogs Africa. Hedgehogs European, now. right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. They could be in North Africa. They could be in North Africa. They could be anywhere, really, if you think about it. It's true. If you think about it, they could really be anywhere. The hedge yeah, I actually hedge. think they're in the Permian because that's when <laughs> Organop <laughs> sits. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's our cue to move on. And that's our okay, cue to talk yep. for another hour about the Permian. Nope, that's the um, end of the episode. That's the Sophie. end of the no. podcast. Yeah, that's the end. <laughs> okay. Also, Murtag is the son of Marzan. Oh my god. Yeah. We're going to talk about... It's definitely going to come up in the next yeah. chapter, though. Yeah. But dang. Big but reveal. Dang. Yeah. Finally, we know. Now, he's done it. Um. Anyway, let's guess what happens next. Speaking of <laughs> that, so the next two chapters are called "The Horns of a Dilemma" and "Hunting for Answers." The Horns wow. of a Dilemma. Yeah, those are definitely both Urgle-based puns. I'm guessing. I was gonna say, yeah. Is this just about the calls and the or- Orgles? Urgles? The Orgles. Orgles. The Orgles. Orgles. Well, I think in the next chapter, Aragorn's going to freak out over him being the son of Marzan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is obviously Murtag's fault, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, because can you imagine anything that would be, like, more hurtful to Murtag than, like, becoming best friends with this guy over the span of, like, a month and a half? And then finally telling him your, like, deep, dark secret that, like, people have hated you for your whole life for no reason? The worst thing in the world would be for Aragon to then go and like treat Murtag like all he is is another oh god potential traitor. So that's oh exactly god. what's gonna happen. You know, no. th- like that's exactly what's gonna happen. <laughs> I hate for that. Murtag. I hate oh. that a lot. I don't want that to be what it is, but it probably will it be probably because is. Aragon's a shitty teen. Yeah, Aragon low key sucks. The only way Aragon's weird moral code can redeem itself is if in the next chapter he's like, well, who your parents are don't matter. Yeah, it's your it's actions that matter and you're a murderer. <laughs> and you murdered a guy. 
<laughs> You're right. <laughs> he's not going to take it well. No, he's not. And Sephira will probably try to be reasonable about it. Yeah. And Aragon will be like, Ma, I can't believe he kept the secret from me. How could he do that? And Sephira yeah. will be like, probably because he thought you would react like this. And Aragon exactly will be like, like this. Ma. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good time. Yeah. I think maybe the second chapter they're trying to find the Varden. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. They're like, where the hell are these guys? <laughs> yeah. Where the hell are these Varden? Aragon's yeah. gonna go around like hitting rocks on waterfalls all over the yeah. place, and the Varden are just gonna be like, "Nah, there's Urgles all over the all over the place." Yeah, here. <laughs> and they're gonna look through their like futuristic ring doorbell and be like, "Nah, <laughs> nah, <laughs> no contact pickup, please. <laughs> leave the elf on the porch. <laughs> please leave the elf on the shelf, and <laughs> we'll, we'll come get her. We'll come get her. <laughs> yeah, I think we got it. Yeah, I think nailed so. it. Wow." Poor Murtag. I yeah, assume. poor Murtag. Probably. Um, let's talk about what else we're reading. I started The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter again because I can only reread books at the moment, I feel. <laughs> so that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's nice. good. I just want to shout out, I've talked about this to both of you. I don't know that I've mentioned it on the podcast. So I just want to say the person who reads... The Strange Case of the Alchemist Daughter series is like f***ing incredible. All of the characters either come from different parts of like, I don't know, whatever historical time period England. They all, she does all the different accents for all the different voices. And then there are people from like other parts of Europe and she does all the different European accents for these Whoa. characters that are like Whoa. in, like they're part of the main cast. And she does like 18 different accents for everyone and it's amazing <laughs> it's so good Impressive. Uh, that's what i'm reading i am struggling i'm i don't know if i'm in a slump or i don't know what's wrong with me but i keep starting and stopping so many books <laughs> i just like sit on my microscope i start a book and i'm like I no and then i start another book and i'm like no <laughs> I started another one. I'm like, no, so we're doing great. But one that kind of stuck is I'm listening to Sister Song by Lucy Holland, which is not bad. It's just a little bit slow for my liking. Um, and there's not, I don't really know what the plot is. So <laughs> it's, it's like, always good. It's yeah. like, anyways, it's, it's fine. And then I started because I was like, you know what I need? I need a book, like a Dan Brown book that is just like fast paced, like action, <laughs> you know, will just like kind of keep me interested while I'm trying to do my work. So I started listening yeah. to Recursion by Blake Crouch, who's the author of Dark Matter, which is another book I read. But I only got, I think, three hours into that. And the narrator in that, they're so slow that I'm listening to it oh, at two times no. speed. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> And this audiobook so is only fast. like nine hours. So I'm like, <laughs> we'll probably wow. be done it pretty quick. But anyways, yeah, those are so the tomorrow. only two that have like kind of stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. That's wow. that's what I'm reading. How about you, Hannah? I'm also struggling. Oh, look uh, at us. <laughs> we're just all yeah. having a good time. Yeah. Um, I have not <laughs> finished or started any books since last time we recorded. So I'm still reading Dragons, the Myths, Legends, and Lore by Douglas Niles and Mar Margaret Weiss, and still listening to 22 Murders, the RCMP, the Killer They Couldn't Catch, and the Rampage That Shocked a Nation by Paul Palango. It's extremely compelling, and like Sophie was mentioning with hers, the narrator is very good. So nice. awesome. if you're into true crime and being mad at cops, <laughs> <laughs> there's one for you. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine, though, when this episode comes out, we will all be at least partially out of our slumps, though, because we'll be reading Husband Material by yes, Alexis Hall yes. for the Midlife Book Club, and I'm so yes, stoked yes, about it. Yes. Oh, yeah, man. me too. I want to reread Boyfriend Material in preparation. Yeah. So maybe I'll yeah. do that. It's my favorite romance novel of the, like, nine that I've read. <laughs> <Aww. laughs> You've you've done well. You've you've increased your romance reading. I have. I'm, I'm proud. Thanks. I yeah. got some good recommendations Yay. from my romance reading friends. You can fil <laughs> filter out the good stuff for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I read the crap so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. 
And then I also read In a Holidays. <laughs> oh, yeah. I did not get to filter bad. that one before. We made a mistake with that one. It was pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> if you... Oh, I also read Events with Us, which you told me not to, and then I did anyway. Uh, yeah, I did tell you not to. <laughs> <laughs> I have no one to blame but myself twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. If you liked this chapter of Midlight Crisis, consider rating and reviewing us on Spotify or your podcatcher of choice. You can talk to us and find fun-related content on social media. We are at Midlight Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and all chapters of the show thus far are available on our website, midlightpod.podbean.com, and on YouTube. And like every millennial with anxiety... Aragon sat motionless in the dark... Wrestling with his disquiet. <laughs> yep. Oh, God. Mood. Every day and night. <laughs> yep. Yeah.